Welcome to all of you on both sides of the Atlantic who are joining us today for this panel discussion entitled Between Russia First and Security First, Ukraine and Changing EU and NATO Priorities. This is the second in a series of discussions that the Ukrainian Free University has planned for this Jubilee year when the university is celebrating its 100th anniversary. And these discussions are dedicated to the topic of current Ukrainian affairs and particularly EU-Ukraine relations. Today's session was organized in cooperation with the journal Brussels Ukraina Review and I am expressing special thanks to Dr. Marta Barandi, the editor of this journal, and also a member of our teaching staff for the wonderful cooperation. We have a very distinguished group of panelists today joining us for this discussion, and I will introduce them in uh, alphabetical order. Viola von Kramon is member of the European Parliament and serves on the committee on foreign relations. She is a member of the delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee. In 2020, she joined the Special Committee on Foreign Interference in All Democratic Processes in the European Union, including this information. And she is a member of the Democracy Support and Election Coordination Group, <clears throat> excuse me, which oversees the Parliament's election observation missions. Previously, Mrs. von Kramon was a member of the German Bundestag and deputy chairwoman of the German-Ukrainian Parliamentary Friendship Group. Daniel Fried is an American diplomat whose career in the U.S. State Department spanned 40 years, during which he served as U.S. Coordinator for Sanctions Policy during the Obama and Trump administrations and helped lead the West's response to Russian military intervention in Ukraine. He also served as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs and as Senior Director for European and Eurasian Affairs at the National Security Council. And he was U.S. Ambassador to Poland. Ambassador Fried is known for being active in designing and implementing U.S. policy to advance freedom and security in Central and Eastern Europe, NATO enlargement, and the Russian-NATO relationship. Currently, Ambassador Fried is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council. Andrius Kubilius is a member of the European Parliament and former Prime Minister of Lithuania. He currently serves on the Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. He is also the Chair of the Delegation to the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly, a member of the delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee and a substitute member of the delegation to the EU Russian Cooperation Community, a Committee. He is the author of such international initiatives as the Marshall Plan for Ukraine, which was later known as the European Plan for Ukraine, the Tree of Strategy for the Future of the European Partnership, and also the Western Strategy towards Russia. And our fourth speaker is Witold Waszczykowski, member of the European Parliament and chair of the Committee on Foreign Affairs and member of the Subcommittee on Security and Defense. He is also a member of the delegation to the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly. His diplomatic career includes service as Poland's liaison officer to NATO in Brussels, after which he became Deputy Parliament Representative of Poland to the newly created diplomatic mission to the North Atlantic Alliance. In, 2000, um, in 2002, he was named Poland's ambassador to Iran, and in 2015, he was Poland's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Our moderator today is Adrian Karatnitsky, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council and Director of its Ukraine-North America Dialogue. For 10 years, he served as president and CEO of Freedom House, a major pro-democracy and economic reform NGO. For 12 years, he directed the benchmark survey, Freedom in the World. Mr. Karatnitsky served as co-director of the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on the U.S. and United Nations, and as a member of the United Nations Blue Ribbon Commission on Ukraine. 
He is co-author and editor of over 20 books focused on post-communist space and global trends in reform. And many of you will know him as a frequent contributor to Foreign Affairs, Washington Post, Newsweek, The Wall Street Journal, and Financial Times. I thank all the participants and the moderator for accepting our invitation today to participate in this discussion. And I turn over the floor to our moderator. Thank you, a great pleasure and a great honor to be in the company of so many friends of Ukraine. I mean, trusted and proven friends of Ukraine in our four uh, speakers. I suppose that one of the anomalies of our discussion is that we frame the issue as between Russia first and security first as a sort of a, a, a set of uh, discussions uh, that I think every European has to uh, talk about. Some Europeans will argue that Russia first is a path to security first. In other words, accommodating Russia and finding common ground um, is the better path of security. Others will say that uh, resilience, uh, strength, uh, the use of sanctions and uh, the fight against uh, corruption and so on is the better, uh, the better path towards security. But the most important thing is that Ukraine is only peripheral to this, but it is not, as we well know. I recall in 1999, I visited uh, someone known to all our speakers, Boris Tarasyuk, uh, a two-time Ukrainian foreign minister and now still a Ukrainian representative in the Council of Europe, an MP, a very distinguished statesman. And as foreign minister, as we walked uh, out of the foreign ministry, he pointed up and said, you think this is the foreign ministry, but 60% of the time that is spent here is spent on Russia. This was still in 1999 before full blown. <laughs> and, and I think that it's also the case that Ukrainian diplomacy in other countries, not only in in, uh, in international institutions is hugely focused on the threat and on the problems that Russia, that Russia causes. So it is absolutely correct uh, to discuss Russia as a central uh, issue in Ukraine's survival, evolution, and so on. And I think we will frame the issue primarily looking uh, at Ukraine, Ukraine's resilience with Russia always uh, uh, in mind. Appropriately enough, because two of our speakers, uh, 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 Minister Bostikovsky and uh, former Prime Minister uh, Kubilius, were uh, uh, introduced a resolution uh, a little over a week ago that the European Parliament passed by, I believe, something like a 569 to uh, 67 overwhelming majority with extremely strong proposals of steps that Europe should take in the event of an accelerated Russian aggression, of serious steps that should be taken in response to the mass uh, repressions that are now going on, both linked to Navalny and going well beyond it. And so I think that it's a probably a good, a good, a good place uh, to begin to measure the temperature, not just of the European Parliament, but also of the European publics, and of, uh, I would say, European business, and most importantly, uh, of European governments, not simply their parliamentary representatives with our distinguished speakers. And I will ask Dan, uh, as part of this, Dan, Daniel Fried, as part of this discussion, uh, more to comment as an outsider who interacts with Europe and we will not focus so much on U.S. policy except in the, in the synchronization of U.S. policy. But perhaps if we could start with uh, 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 Madame von Kramen uh, with uh, uh, her thoughts about where uh, things stand. But before we go, I, uh, before we turn to our speakers, I'll ask those that, of our speakers who are not speaking to mute themselves until such time as they are joined into the, into the conversation. And, uh, uh, and, and the other point that I want to make is that we don't simply have uh, three parliamentarians. We have parliamentarians uh, in, the, in, in the presence of uh, Mr. Kubilius and uh, Dr. Vashikovsky, uh, perhaps uh, uh, who are uh, representatives of governing parties. Uh, and we have, uh, if you read the latest <laughs> polls in Germany, we have 
a representative of the party that perhaps in September may be the leading party uh, in Germany uh, in our first uh, uh, inter inter interlocutor, uh, uh, Madame von Kramen. Uh, I would ask you, uh, with with permission, to maybe to get a dialogue going that we each maybe talk. All of you speak for maybe two or three minutes to kind of sort of begin the first question of where where uh, does Europe stand now in its assessment and your of of the Russian threat and of how to to cope with it. Thank you very very much, Adrian, and also uh, Maria and all the others who have provided. Um, and who have facilitated this uh, great event here this afternoon, at least in, uh, in Central Europe, it's afternoon. Um, well, do, uh, where does Europe stand when it comes to, to Russia? I think that now almost everyone woke up and is aware uh, of uh, the facts uh, which lie around and which are so obvious when it comes to, to Russia. The last uh, attempts of the so-called maneuver um, um, along the uh, Ukrainian borders had not just threatened Ukraine. I think there was a, a kind of a nervousness. Um, there was a kind of a uncertainty how to deal with this all over Europe. And I've talked to many people in my home country in Germany, but also of course in the parliament in many think tanks. And there was obviously um, um, the, the will of the Putin regime, again, to test the ground. Um, how far can we go with the Biden administration? What does it mean? Will they really um, provide security for Ukraine? If we go further, um, how can we deal with this, uh, with the Crimea annexation? If we really need some more water or, and, and, and so all these little bits and pieces, I think that uh, they try to test. But what, he, what they have achieved, I mean, you have mentioned the resolution, and I think um, it was easier that time to get a majority on this, to get much tougher rhetorics on this. I think the commitment in the European Parliament for Ukraine's security, but also then for uh, the EU security, was, uh, was much more and was much easier to, to achieve. Nevertheless, uh, when it comes to the heart facts would be really would we be able and willing to provide ukraine with uh, weapons would we deliver uh, weapons would there be uh, any more than the task force uh, in the baltic i'm not so sure um, I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, let's say, aware that at least the Green Party, and you were referring to maybe that someone from the Green Party will also be part of the government. I don't want to go too far, so let's wait and see what the results of the federal election will be. But nevertheless, it looks like uh, that we might be a part of the next and the future uh, coalition. Uh, we Greens are always and we're always very, um, uh, not, not just committed, but engaged in, in terms of um, Eastern partnership, in terms of our direct neighborhood, but also in terms of rhetorics and sanctions and actions when it uh, um, uh, regarded uh, Russia. We were the only ones, the only party uh, all over uh, uh, Germany uh, from the very beginning opposing uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, we are the only ones who were very outspoken when it came to human rights um, violations, uh, independent uh, media and so on, but also when it came to uh, the Ukraine uh, Maidan events, uh, the uh, revolution of dignity. I think it was mainly the Greens who asked for support and assistance and really a broader package um, of solidarity from Germany, but also from the European Union. So in that respect, I think the Greens had always delivered, were always reliable. Uh, and our um, so candidate Annalena Baerbock has recently given a very interesting interview, very impressive, where she was speaking about more uh, toughness and dialogue and she was uh, mainly uh, received support 
through all the society, which is also important to see. It, it's not just the Greens, uh, but many people, at least in Germany now, share uh, the perspective that we need a tougher handling on, on uh, Russia. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I ask uh, 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 Prime Minister Kobilius to next take the floor and maybe to talk about, uh, again, this, this moment, your role in the resolution. There was another interesting phenomenon in the resolution, and that was that the, Le uh, the Lega in Italy, which is considered to be uh, friendly to, uh, to Putin and certainly its leader, uh, has uh, shown a great deal of, uh, of sympathy wearing Putin t-shirts and so on. What happened? Were there some surprises about how broad the the support for such a strong resolution was? And does it signal uh, also any changes you would think in the bigger capitals, meaning not just in the parliamentarian votes as a resolution, but when it becomes more binding as a, ma a matter of policy? Are we moving from a kind of an environment that uh, 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 Madame von Kramon has uh, presented in terms of understanding to, uh, to, uh, to action? How do you assess that? Well, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, really, Adrian and, and Maria. And uh, well, first of all, <laughs> really, I, it's it's quite difficult to add anything to what uh, Viola have said. You know, since really, you know, we 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 see you know that uh, the recent actions of uh, Putin of Kremlin are really opening uh, eyes to many you know capitals and and in the parliament. Uh, perhaps there is nothing new, usually on uh, resolutions during the last years, on Navalny, on, on his poisoning, on, on his arrest, which we had before, you know, were also supported by, by a huge majority. I don't know about uh, Italians, you know, from Lega <laughs> was not following so, so closely, but numbers were always quite big. Of course, you know, uh, as you know, you know, uh, foreign policy and security policy in, inside of EU, you know, is uh, is uh, quite complicated in its, you know, establishment. Uh, parliament makes good and strong, you know, statements, but, uh, you know, foreign policy is in the hands of uh, member states, you know, of the capital, so not always, you know, things are moving the same line as we are, you know, as we are speaking in, in the parliament, but really we see also forthcoming uh, perhaps changes uh, even in, in, in Berlin, which are promising, you know, that uh, toughness can come, you know, into, into, into EU policy towards Russia. There are a lot of discussions how we can, you know, revise that policy. We are preparing some, some a new report on that in, in the parliament. And, uh, and here are really interesting, interesting uh, articles, experts, you know, I would, uh, you know, uh, I, I was really quite surprised by a recent article from uh, European Council on Foreign Relations by, by Carl Bildt and his team, uh, you know, Popescu and others, where really exactly the same, the same line was, was uh, uh, spoken out that till now EU was too much trying to accommodate, you know, to keep this Russia first or Putin first you know, policy. And uh, there is really a need for revision into much more tough uh, language and tough, uh, tough policy. So uh, really question is where Putin is heading. Uh, I you know it's not easy to answer what, what he will try to do next, what is his goals and what are his aims, but, uh, but perhaps uh, what we need to uh, see in a very clear uh, light that you know to have any hopes that we can agree you know with Putin on any security issues uh, at least from my point of view are quite naive so I would you know I would uh, uh, very very easily you know uh, suggest to change you know to change title of this nice conversation from you know it's very good from Russia first to security first but security first you know, I can, I can, I can suggest, you know, that it would be good to speak about democracy in Russia first. You know, again, maybe for somebody it, it can look like a naive hope that democracy can be, can come into Russia, but democracy is an answer uh, to a lot of problems which we see now in our relations with Russia. You know. uh, democracies usually are not fighting, uh, you know, with each other and so on and so on. 
So that is why, you know, to, uh, to try to see what are our possibilities to assist Russian people, Russian opposition, you know, uh, Russian, Russian, you know, protesters uh, in, in really, uh, you know, in their wish to have democracy in, in Russia. That is one of, of the goals which we need to have in mind. On, on when we are talking about, uh, about EU policy, or Western policy, you know, towards uh, security first, uh, you know, uh, agenda, I would say that we need to have perhaps in mind really uh, to have uh, some kind of holistic approach. We need to have really in our, in our, in our understanding quite a clear picture of Russia, where Russia is moving, how things are, are changing in Russia. Second, how, you know, what is going on in Ukraine? Ukrainian success can be very important, really, in influencing even, you know, uh, developments in Russia itself. You know, it's, it can be an inspiration for Russian people to, to follow, you know, this uh, good democratic, democratic example. And the uh, success of uh, Ukraine very much will depend on what will be EU policy towards Ukraine, towards integration of Ukraine. And I think that we need really to ask ourselves very simple questions how we can make uh, EU doors more open, you know, if not totally open for, for integration of, of Ukraine, at least to make it uh, more open. Because the answer to the question, you know, both on, 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 on how to assist Ukrainian successful de de you know, development of its success and how to, and how to bring uh, more security comes through, you know, the doors of integration. And we can talk uh, in, a, in both you know, economical integration. There are again proposals on that you can bring some kind of security compacts for you know, associated countries like Ukraine and so on. So those are issues which we need to have you know, in mind and we need to see those, you know, the, whole, the whole picture, holistic picture. Russia, Ukraine, Western community, including EU. That would be my 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 answer to this, you know, to the question how to move from Russia first to security first. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn to um, Minister Vostchikovsky and maybe move the question. He, he represents a government as, as does, uh, uh, represents a country uh, as does uh, uh, Prime Minister Kubilius that is very strong on more active support for Ukraine that does not shy away from the idea that Ukraine should be given some resources for its kinetic military uh, capabilities and so forth. And I want to just sort of maybe start from that dimension. I think there is, you know, broadly speaking, there is support for sanctions, uh, certainly among your, your colleagues, but the, but the question and the idea of helping Ukraine, if Ukraine is not to be a member of NATO, is there something, is there some way of building broader consensus that Ukraine can be given <coughs> support in the way that say the United States is giving to build up its, uh, its military potential, possibly in cooperation with uh, NATO member countries? So what are, how real, Realistic, do you think this is uh, is 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 the sort of the center of gravity tilting towards a, a greater understanding of the threat that Russia poses? And maybe to even complicate your answer, what what uh, uh, what do you think is Putin's intention, final intention vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? Yes, thank you. Greetings from Warsaw. Can you see me? Can you hear me? So I can continue. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let me start first uh, uh, describing a little bit the situation in Europe. Uh, I think that uh, Europe, especially Western Europe, is a little bit confused about the situation. Uh, we had uh, a week ago um, a discussion with uh, Joseph Borrell on how to react, uh, uh, how to respond to the last escalation of military force uh, by, by Russia. And, uh, uh, there is no reaction from, from, from the West. Actually, uh, Mr. Zelensky, offer, Mr. Zelensky uh, request to visit Berlin, I mean, part of the Normandy film, uh, was uh, rejected by Angela Merkel. He went to Paris, but he came back from Paris empty-handed. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, openly rejected uh, his appeal to visit Kiev. And uh, President Biden offered uh, uh, direct talks to, to Putin, 
uh, to solve the uh, Ukrainian question. So actually, he, he offered Putin what he expects for, for years, a direct talk to, to the United States, a kind of a Cold, uh, cold War style uh, reaction to, to decide about Ukraine above the Ukraine heads. Uh, uh, so the European Union is confused. They don't want to solve the, the problem. They want to pacify the problem. They want to freeze the problem just to come back to the for appeasement policy, to the business as usual with Russia, because there is a myth that they can uh, make a, a huge deals uh, uh, trading directly with uh, with Russia. So let me remind you that the, the trade between Germany and Poland is far much far bigger than the trade between Germany and Russia. Uh, but of course, there is a myth uh, in Western capitals that uh, there is a kind of a bonanza in Russia, and we're supposed to uh, care about um, Russia first. Um, uh, about Putin, I, I think I, I, I disagree with those who think that he is unpredictable. He is very much predictable. Uh, let me remind you that a few years ago he mentioned that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest tragedy in the history of, of, of Russia. So his plan maximum, plan A, is to come back to the position of the Soviet Union vis-a-vis -vis the United States and to rule just like in the 70s and 80s, the world by this uh, diet, by this summits of uh, uh, US-Russia uh, summits. It's, uh, it's impossible, of course, although recently Biden offered him this kind of a, a summit. So his plan B is to create uh, some kind of 19th century concert of powers. Uh, just to, to rule the world with a few countries, few powers. Uh, we, we can say. Uh, he, is, um, he, he is not very comfortable to be confronted by the institutions, by the European Union, 27 of, uh, of us, or by NATO. He just wants to pick a few countries from these in institutions and deal with them directly and to solve, to rule the, the problems. Um, so he is predictable and of course, uh, he's, whenever he is a chance to do us any harm, he is going to do this. Uh, uh, how we can respond? Of course, there is no deficit of instrument in the West uh, uh, to stop Russian aggression. Uh, and we openly discuss this in the European but of course we don't have executive power to implement all these uh, appeals about uh, getting uh, him rid of uh, from from sweet uh, uh, financial operation uh, to stop uh, buying gas from from Russia, stop constructing the Nord Stream the second uh, gas pipe and things like that. We can impose a price tag also on part of the Russian society, on oligarchs, uh, celebrates those who support Putin and those who benefit from the policy of ag aggressive policy. Uh, why, why we still uh, deal with the, these oligarchs? Why we keep the uh, the properties um, in Spain, Cyprus, and other countries? Uh, why we keep inviting Russian um, uh, uh, celebrities uh, or, or sports people to to play with us? At the same time, the the other Russian colleagues are shooting in Donbas. Why the laboratories in Harvard, Oxford are still open for the Russian uh, scientists? You know, they they benefit uh, from our openness, uh, and uh, of course, they still support uh, Putin. So once we get rid of uh, this opportunity for them, they start to think: uh, Was it is it still beneficial to support Putin aggression aggressive uh, uh, policy um, about Ukraine? Well, there are a number of things we can we can help them. Of course, we cannot help them to win the war with Russia. It's impossible. At, at least we can help them to stop further escalation of uh, aggression by selling them and giving them uh, defensive weapons, uh, anti-tank, anti-missile, anti-aircraft uh, weapons uh, to stop further Russian aggression. The second, we can uh, help them to to progress uh, in the process of, of reforms. Um, uh, then we can uh, we can open different kinds of a path and channels of cooperation with the European Union. 
there are a number of things we can we can open invite them different kind of agencies like Frontex for ex, for instance could Ukrainians can be part of this uh, in our part of Europe we developed recently uh, something which is called Three Cs Initiative uh, which is about energy security and uh, communication and transport uh, let's Ukrainian to uh, to, jo to, to join these two uh, areas of cooperation, be part, at least informally, part of European Union programs, at least in this uh, uh, section of our uh, cooperation. We, we can think also about the new format uh, to replace normal formula and uh, mixed peace process, because after seven years, uh, how many years we can wait longer for, for the results, uh, how to solve this conflict, so we can invite openly United States, UK to this uh, format, United States and UK, there's a part of the uh, Budapest uh, uh, memorandum from 1994. So they're supposed to be responsible for the uh, peaceful solution of the conflict with, uh, with Russia. Uh, I think that in this new formula, we're supposed to invite some, some neighbors of, of Ukraine uh, like uh, Baltic countries, Poland, Romania, possibly Turkey, because all these countries are affected by this conflict and by an escalation. We are, as Poland, we are in a very unique situation because we are the neighbor of aggressor and the neighbor of uh, victim of aggression. So we are very much responsible for uh, uh, for uh, providing information to the to the West about what's going on in our part of Europe and what's going on on the Russian-Ukrainian front. So as you can see, uh, let me finish this. There is no deficit of instruments, how to deal with uh, Russia. There is no uh, deficit of instruments, a proposal, how to solve the, uh, the conflict, Russian-Ukrainian conflict. There is a lack of will, lack of determination. We have uh, not too many statements. Uh, in the Western capitals, we have too many politicians uh, just want to make a geschäft, tomorrow's geschäft with, with Russia, win the next, uh, next day election, and forget about the, the problems which are outside of, uh, of European Union. Thanks. Thank you very much. And also thank you for invoking the United States, which is a wonderful transition to our next uh, speaker, uh, Ambassador uh, Daniel Free. I'd like uh, him to maybe take a look at his, maybe offer us his perspectives on what he thinks is cooking in Europe on uh, Russo-European relations and uh, Ukraine in that sort of triangle. And secondly, what the 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 Biden administration intends and what the Biden administration's re-entry entry into uh, the shaping of Euro-Atlantic relations uh, means for closer cooperation and the advancement of, of policies that are in the interests of uh, secu Europe's security, but also of Ukraine's security as an integral part of Europe. So uh, Dan, if you would uh, maybe take a few minutes to offer us your wisdom on that. Thank you, Adrian and um, Vitaly Vas. It's great to be speaking to you all. Um, I witam serdecznie, um, Minister Vaschikovsky, um, an, old, an old colleague. Um, today's a good day for this discussion, particularly of American perspectives, because the US Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, is today in Kyiv. I think that is important. I think the United, the Biden administration, whatever, um, whatever the past four years have meant in terms of U.S.-Ukrainian relations, and it has been a difficult time. The Biden administration is looking at Ukraine clearly and well, and is looking at Russia. I think clearly and well. Um, I'll get to that. But first, on Europe, um, I understand the concerns that Ukrainians have about the mixed signals coming from Europe. Minister Vashchikovsky described the more cynical and less sustainable Euro strain of European opinion, um, may, something like, uh, we have to get along with Russia, so let's just do business, and let's not let 
pesky countries like Ukraine or the Baltic states or Poland to get in the way. I'm being, that is a crude, um, but not, I fear, inaccurate summary of one strain of European opinion. But it is not the dominant strain and it is not a growing strain. As I see it from this side of the Atlantic, um, Putin has managed to alienate Europe in general, the European Union in particular. Uh, he has, um, Viola von uh, Kramen knows this far better than I do, um, but I suspect he, he has moved the needle on German opinion in an unfavorable direction um, with respect to Putin uh, tolerance. Uh, he has, Putin has alienated the Czech Republic, for God's sakes, which had a notably pro-Russian president. He is managing to alienate the Bulgarian government that, uh, and Bulgarian society has some histor good historical association. Dan, we've right lost now. your audio, I think. Oh dear, I heard you. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. All right. Um, I can hear you, I can hear you. Okay. Um, Putin's aggression is alienating much of Europe. And I think Europe is moving in a direction where they are going to be more willing to resist Putin's aggression and more willing to support Ukraine and that without illusions. It will be important for the United States and Europe to come up with a consistent Russia policy. It will never be identical, but it can be consistent and complementary. And that policy, I think, is not hard to discern. It will involve various pillars. I, I have four. One of them is resisting Putin's aggression. That will be the biggest pillar in the short term. And resisting Russian aggression takes a variety of forms. Um, through NATO, through support for Ukraine, through resilience, through counter disinformation, through exposing Russian corruption and drawing up the channels of corrupt Russian money flows. It will have an element of cooperation where possible, where possible. The Biden administration's first step toward Russia was to extend the New START uh, arms control treaty. That was an, a gesture of cooperation. The Biden administration also introduced sanctions and clearly indicated its willingness to increase these. So Biden administration has both of these pillars. A third pillar will involve attempts to stabilize the relationship. I am um, not as cynical or as critical as Minister Vashtikovsky about Biden's offer of a meeting to Putin, because that meeting was framed in terms of clarity about the way Biden sees Putin. It was not put into a framework of a new reset or illusions about cooperation. It was a, an offer of dialogue in a context of reality about Putin's aggression. In other words, it was an offer of a meeting on our terms, not Putin's terms. Now, Minister Vashtikovsky has a good basis for at least raising the question of the US and Russia doing a deal over the heads of the, of the Ukrainians. President Trump would have been happy to do so had he been allowed to, but there was too much resistance in the United States. I do not think Biden will make that mistake at all. I don't think his team is inclined to make that mistake not Tony Blinken, certainly not Victoria Nuland, who is traveling with Blinken uh, to Kyiv, um, not Karen Dunfried, who's been nominated to be Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. Um, it is a strong team and a team with immediate and fresh experience with, with Vladimir Putin's aggression. A fourth pillar of a sustainable relationship with Russia is a long-term investment in Russian society. And that means, that means reaching out to the Russian people, supporting free Russian media, supporting exchanges where we can, 
investing, in other words, in a better future with a better Russia. No, I am not talking about regime change. I am talking about things about an updated version of very successful things the United States and the West did during the Cold War, which is to, was to reach out to Soviet society and make a long-term investment in it. Um, with respect to policy toward Ukraine, the United States has made clear we will not accept Russia's annexation of Crimea. Blinken and the State Department made that explicit in a formal statement yesterday. I suspect Tony Blinken ha will or has already made that clear. And we will not allow Russia to treat Ukraine as if it doesn't exist or as if it is Putin's and Kremlin property. That means a long-term effort to work with Ukraine. At the same time, a second element of US policy toward Ukraine is going to be to push Ukraine to reform itself from within, to build a nation which is both democratic, which Ukraine arguably already is, but also respects the rule of law, which Ukraine has not yet done, not, in, not to sufficient detail, not to sufficient extent. Ukraine basically needs to follow the successful path of Poland and the Baltic states a generation ago. And I know this from working on the issues in the early 1990s. Poland's success in the early 1990s meant that when Poland started pushing for NATO and EU membership in the mid 1990s, it started even earlier, but the big drive came in the mid 1990s. And when it did so, it had enormous political capital because it was already seen as a success story. That political capital that Poles from right to left built for themselves through their success at democratic free market transformation at home, that political capital they could then invest in their drive to join the institutions of an undivided West. And I mention this because I was involved in the policy from the US side, but I always said at the time and after that, the, that Poland and other countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but particularly Poland and the Baltic states later, gave me the political capital with which to work because they were doing their work at home. My point is perfectly obvious. Ukraine has the ability to generate similar political capital for itself. And it needs to do so from through a domestic transformation. And we in the West need to help. We need to help Ukraine deal with the external aggression from Putin, which has an element of both military pressure and internal subversion. But we also need to push Ukraine to push through its reforms, its transformational reforms. And I suspect that this is something that the Biden administration a message the Biden administration is conveying today in Kyiv. That's not private knowledge, but I think my guess is right. So this is a, an important day. I see that Europe is getting its act together with respect to Russia. I realize I may sound like a naive American, but I'm trying to look at the hopeful side of things. And I think that Putin has in the Soviet era, he, would, he could be accused of voluntaristic adventurism by his behavior recently and by the fact that he received significant pushback in his latest threats to, against Ukraine from the United States, but also from Chancellor Merkel in Germany. So I think we are in a position of a coalescing decent Western policy toward Putin and the potential of a coherent supportive policy of the West for Ukraine. Um, and as for the German elections and the Greens, I can only applaud the consistent and principled record of the Green Party. And you know, uh, I hope that, that, that those policy elements find their way into the positions of the next German government, one way or another. So, 
Thank you. That's a great transition yet again. First, Minister Bashikovsky handing over to Ambassador Fried, and now by raising the issue of Ukraine's internal development, we have the benefit of, you know, of, of parliamentarians and politicians and government officials who've had a deep interaction with, with Ukraine over the course of many years. And so I think I'd like to engage you a little bit in, in your understanding and maybe to discuss how Europe's, um, how your colleagues understand in government and in parliament, uh, the degree to which Ukraine is resilient, the degree to which Ukraine has is divided internally, the degree to which it has uh, the possibility of achieving what Dan uh, has uh, set out as an aim of uh, ridding itself of this yoke of corruption, all of those kinds of, uh, of issues. And, uh, but I wanna just kind of leave one one thought before we move down the path of fighting oligarchy and fighting corruption, and that is that, uh, in my view, the the, the process of a transition in the fight against corruption and the fight against oligarchy has to be done carefully so that there are other levers of, of influence and power in society. The oligarchic influences are too strong, but we saw how when Mr. Putin moved against only one oligarch, all the other oligarchs went into line. And the real question is, how can the transition that tames oligarchy in Ukraine, that deals with their role in corruption, be done in such a way that there is also a presence, not only for civil society and of the influence of Western diplomacy and of, I would say, the Maidan on Ukrainian leaders, but also the influence of business on uh, the country's leaders as a constraint on an excessive, uh, uh, you know, uh, concentrations uh, of power. And I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, Madame von Kramen. Uh, I think you, your interactions with Ukraine uh, and interests in, in its uh, democratic development uh, make you an ideal speaker to continue the discussion. Thank you. Yes, that's a very broad field of activity. If you dig a little bit deeper uh, into, into these domestic issues, which also have an external dimension, while if uh, Ukraine does not become a consolidated democracy, there is no chance for a map uh, for, for NATO side. So I was asked before by one of the members how we Greens see the um, members action plan from the NATO side. I'm personally very much in favor but I see there's a long way to go. And it's not just the military reforms, it's about consolidating uh, their own democracy at home. And from that perspective, um, you said that um, uh, the executive is pretty or rather split. I mean, we have seen so many exchanges of ministers and positions the last uh, weeks and months. Um, we have seen many faces coming in and out, uh, reshuffling of, of, of different uh, positions in the, in the government. And we see also that um, the interest dominated uh, or parts of the interest dominated group of Zelensky makes uh, this ruling of the, of the country not just easier. Um, I think for many of us who observe Ukraine, that was obvious from the very beginning after um, the, the vote or the election in 2019 was over. But nevertheless, uh, Zelensky now, and therefore I'm very grateful uh, for Biden's um, interference and for the pressure coming mainly from US. Um, Zelensky now uh, uh, fe uh, feels the pressure coming from the international community. While for the last four years, it was definitely very, very difficult to find a transatlantic, um, let's say joint um, approach or common approach to many of these domestic uh, reform issues. And it was not so easy to push the government for this or the other direction. And now I, I see, and today after the visit, maybe we will see even more uh, new initiatives from the Zelensky government and from the presidential administration. I'm still very much concerned about some figures in his team, especially uh, Andrei Yarmak, who has obviously close ties um, 
into Russia and into some of the also uh, security service uh, circles. And that's, um, for me, it's a very dubious uh, figure and it's very difficult how we're going to deal with uh, those people who are so close and who are actually one of the major decision makers uh, in the Zelensky team. Um, therefore, I thought it is very, it was a very courageous decision uh, from the Zelensky side before even informing Andrei Yarmark to close down the three Medvedchuk channels. I think that was a good, uh, very good and a tough decision. And it was helpful uh, that the US administration helped with this. Um, when it came to, let's say, the, the crucial and the core um, domestic reforms, we talk about uh, judiciary, we talk about um, also, I would call it health reform. Um, and, and uh, some other reforms, uh, we see always two steps forward and one step back. Um, energy security is also something where I would, um, let's say, see a more coherent um, um, uh, position from the European Union. We have mentioned the Nord Stream 2 um, uh, project, uh, which hopefully we can stop um, after September, and we will make sure that this pipeline will be never used for any gas uh, um, transfer um, or delivering. But of course, this is still uh, to be negotiated. Also, in that respect, the Biden administration is of big help, um, I think. This is clear. There is a big interest, a joint interest, not to use this pipeline. But also we have to push uh, the Ukrainian government into more alternative, into renewables. Um, the European Green Deal, I think some of the politicians, decision makers have internalized what it means, but it's not uh, sufficient. So when we want to phase out of Russian gas, of coal, of oil and at some point um, also of nuclear, not now, that's for sure, not the first priority, but nevertheless, we have to invest massively and it needs also foreign direct investment. And with the last decisions in the, um, in the radar, that uh, only created a lot of uh, insecurities and all the investment which were planned mainly also on hydropower on other projects were stopped and that came from the oligarch interest uh, from from Kolomoisky's group and others. So there is a lot to do from the European side. We have to find the right alliance. We have to find the right groups to protect, but we have to also make sure that the draft laws, especially in energy and in on the judiciary side, are the ones who can end up in more, let's say, an economical, stable framework. So we have really a more environmentally um, an attractive environment. I mean, and a business environment, which uh, is, is um, set up uh, to increase uh, the, the, the right uh, companies, uh, which would uh, in, in, um, encourage small and medium enterprises, innovative uh, um, technology uh, or high technology uh, companies uh, being settled. Uh, and also then we can work with European funds from Horizon, some corporation. Uh, Mr. Kubilius is also does work on research and, um, and, and, and science uh, issues. I think there's a big field which we have not really uh, used when it came to Ukraine. I would see this also as part of the post-COVID uh, program, which could be much more used from the Ukrainian side if we had proper people in place in the ministries, in agencies, and also in the presidential administration. So this is mainly up to Ukraine uh, to put um, some proposals on the table and to really use our money, the European Recovery Funds Horizon and other uh, money um, from, from special support for Ukraine for their particular um, uh, uh, purposes. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn to Prime Minister Kubilius with 
a little bit of a continue the discussion that has been launched in terms of reform and resilience, but also add another issue. You come from a country where national identity is pretty clear cut. You may have uh, a small <laughs> group of uh, dissenters, but pretty much everyone understands there is a unified sense of patriotism. There are no language issues and so on. How do you assess the progress Ukraine is making towards national unity? And to what extent do you think this is a sort of a, the devil's playground for Putin? How powerful is that devil's playground these days? And is you at what kind of mechanism and how widely is this problem? How is this problem perceived by, not just by you as a, as a person who understands Ukraine more deeply, but by your European colleagues? Well, uh, thanks a lot for, for, for this question. Maybe I will try to, to, to put it into some kind of broader, you know, uh, picture. First of all, uh, really, if we are looking into Ukraine, it's uh, really an amazing country. It also has a lot of typical post-Soviet, you know, features, which is pretty natural and which started real reforms only after the last Maidan after the Dignity Revolution. That is the difference. If we started back in 1990, so Ukraine started just in 2014. I always had a joke that, you know, if you, will, if you want to understand in the post-Soviet, you know, area, is the country really doing reforms, despite what the leaders are speaking, look when the Lenin monuments uh, were removed in the country. That is a feature, you know, and that is what, uh, what had happened in, in Ukraine only after the last Maidan. So that is, that is one thing. Second, in, in some way, you know, I can uh, say, answering to your, to your question on identity, uh, that is nothing new, but in some way we need to thank Mr. Putin for, you know, really creating a pro-Western identity of Ukraine, you know, which, which came again with a lot of, you know, tragedies, blood and so on, but fighting for, for, for European direction, for Ukrainian identity. That is what uh, what helped you know now nation to have uh, in majority clear clear identity. Okay, of course there are there is an opposition, you know pro Russian opposition, so so called opposition bloc. But uh, exactly today I saw on on Europejska Pravda on Union I don't know which 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 website I read uh, the last opinion polls which were showing that Zelensky party would win twenty eight percent. Uh, second is this, you know, opposition bloc 19, then Poroshenko 18, uh, Yulia Timoshenko 11, and then some, some, some smaller, smaller groups, some smaller parties. So which means that really, you know, more or less uh, not pro-European uh, parties, pro-Russian parties have only about, you know, 20%, at least what opinion polls are showing. So that is not a, a bad, bad, you know, bad numbers. Uh, second point, really, of course, Ukraine needs to make reforms. It needs to consolidate its political will on reforms. We can speak a lot about, you know, how to, you know, how to, uh, uh, how to cut uh, oligarch influence, how to bring rule of law and things like that. Uh, not everything is very easy to do, but uh, the biggest problem, I think, especially when we Europeans are talking towards Ukrainians, you know, about what kind of reforms they need to do, we are forgetting, you know, at least a, a little bit our own responsibility. Uh, what kind of reforms we need to do inside of you in order really for Ukraine to, you know, to, to, speed up, uh, to speed up Ukrainian integration. Because at least in my opinion, there are no any example of single country uh, after Second World War, you know, after Soviet Union collapse, which would manage to make you know, reforms and to establish stable and successful democracy uh, in post-totalitarian, post-communist country without really integration uh, towards you. Uh, Ambassador Dan Fried, you know, mentioned our experience, you know, Baltics and, and Poland, like, like good examples. But we should not forget that from 1993, you know, with Copenhagen criteria announced by EU Council at that time, we saw very clearly perspectives that we shall be able to join EU. And then, you know, step by step, we, you know, after, after 10 years, so, you know, after 1993, we were, you know, at the gates of, of EU. And that was motivation for us to keep reforms. So this very practical, you know, instrument, what we call, you know, carrot and stick, 
that is what is what is working, at least in our example. You know. I can tell you, I was, you know, I was in politics, I was prime minister at that time, and I saw very much, you know, you couldn't believe, you know, step step aside from direction towards EU at that time, domestically would kill you as politician, you know, immediately. That was how it how it was working. Now, what I'm telling, you know, uh, why why I'm not uh, satisfied with, you know, well, Vital Vashikovsky spoke about, you know, EU, EU inability to bring security in a proper way towards Ukraine. I am dissatisfied very much with EU inability to bring some kind of integration perspective. Look, we recently we asked, you know, and, and we got very interesting uh, report from very prominent uh, think tank here in Brussels, CEPS, Center of European Policy Studies. They compared, uh, you know, uh, uh, Eastern Partnership countries, associated countries like Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and Moldova, with Western Balkan countries, which are, you know, you know, Western Balkan countries. Uh, they have membership perspective. Uh, they are candidates towards EU, and the uh, comparison, according to all the different data, was showing very simple, uh, was bringing very simple conclusion. There is no big difference in between of Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, and Western Balkan countries. But the difference is in EU attitude. Western Balkan countries have membership perspective. Uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova still do not have membership perspective. The question is why? Well, I can uh, I can guess you know that again, there is some some you know some countries, some capitals which are you know which are thinking uh, that it can provoke uh, Putin and so on. From my point of view, exactly it would be opposite. You know bringing you know i'm not talking you now about about immediate you know membership or whatever but giving clear perspective in in our case you know answering very simple question where we imagine ukraine should be for example in 20 set like europeans we need to have very simple answer what we expect from from ukraine and if we and we want if we want really ukraine to become successful and and going with integration we need to show them what is the way so that is why we started to discuss also, since you know, really for you, it's, it would be difficult uh, for time being to speak about, about enlargement and membership, but there is a very interesting formula, which was brought uh, back in 2003 by Romano Prodi, you know, who, who said, let's promise to all the neighbors, everything but institution. All the benefits of real you know, membership, like integration into single market, access to EU funds and so on and so on. But for time being, maybe, you know, Till EU will resolve its own, you know, domestic uh, internal problems with decision making and so on, which are huge. That is why we are going into this, you know, conference on on, on the future of Europe. Uh, till then, maybe not to promise, you know, uh, not to promise uh, presence in institutions, presence in decision making. But at least let's give any, you know, some clear path for Ukraine where Ukraine needs to go, what it can achieve during the next ten years. And that could be really that motivation, that carrot, and then we can use you know, painful stick if, 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 if that will not, you know, if, if, if Ukraine would, would make any kind of mistakes. That is how it works in our, in our region. That is what we can see again from Ukrainian example, how much Ukraine you know, achieved when they were trying to, to get the association agreement, how much they achieved and how much they did when, when he was with a free you know, agreement promise. Let's, let's, let's go in, in that direction let's not be afraid you know and that is exactly what again i'm saying that should be also our part of uh, of our policy towards russia success of ukraine is the best best instrument really to try at least to assist the changes in russia itself thank you uh, i'd like to turn to uh, 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 minister vashchikovsky and uh, to ask uh, on the question of resilience uh, the question of diplomatic resilience, but also the effectiveness over the last year and a half, two years of the Zelensky team and of President Zelensky, who has made, uh, in his view, I would say, earnest efforts to try to open a dialogue with Putin to reduce the, uh, I would say, the rhetoric to sometimes not speak in ways that he believes may be provocative. To what extent do you think that was a successful policy? To what extent is it immaterial? Uh, and to what extent is, is he successfully uh, engaging Europe 
by virtue of the kind of diplomacy he's pursued uh, with Russia? Is that helpful, harmful, uh, or, or meaningless, so to speak? Mm. No, I think it's a partially successful. He is partially successful, but uh, would be uh, quite easy from uh, my point of view as a Polish politician uh, to criticize Ukraine for the lack of reform, for lacking behind with, uh, with reforms. Um, but, uh, um, and I appreciate what uh, Dan Freen mentioned about Poland in the beginning of the 1990s, the mid of 1990s, but that was unique situation for us. First of all, so for, first of all we were uh, all united in Poland to come back to the West. Uh, there were no, there was no discussion about uh, some kind of a uh, uh, third world, middle world, middle uh, uh, way to to create something new. No, it was a clear decision to to join NATO, join European Union, and we of course uh, adopted uh, uh, something we can call a cold Turkey approach at the beginning of 1990s. Very. Uh, costly reforms, uh, but because the, it was supported by the whole um, society. Uh, the second, we got a clear perspective of membership in NATO and European Union. It was the question of time, but there was no question of if. It was just a question when, a little bit question how. Uh, there is no such a perspective as Mr. Kobilu just rightly mentioned for, for the Ukraine. And the third aspect, we were dealing at that time, 1990s, with a very weak Russia. It was Russia of not quite sober Yeltsin, if we all remember. So that was a little bit easier. And now we have Putin. We don't have a clear perspective uh, in the European Union for the Ukrainians. So that's the, that's the problem. We have to create this perspective. Politicians, as also Mr. Koblius mentions, they need the stick, but they need also the carrots. The carrots for themselves, they have to be successful and they need the carrots for the society to support them in this very cost uh, reforms. Uh, so we have to create this uh, situation for, for, for Ukraine. And as I mentioned, at least let's, let's try to open some programs uh, of European Union for the Ukrainians, let's bring them closer to some uh, 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 agencies, agendas of, uh, uh, of, the, European, of the European Union. Um, so these are the problems of Mr. Uh, Zelensky. He cannot say openly to the society that when, if we implement uh, this program of reforms, if we accept, uh, adopt this uh, acquis communitaire, uh, we will join the European Union. No, no, there is no such promise. And I remember <clears throat> that in Poland, we evaluated in 1990s that implementation of just a legal basis of, uh, of the membership, uh, it was about 6% of GDP. So uh, regardless of other transformation, just uh, adoption of this implementation of the legal basis of the Aki Comintar. So it's very costly. Uh, so without these uh, promises, uh, of course, uh, uh, Zelensky has no chance to convince the society to, to work harder, to, to concentrate, to focus on, on reforms. He has to spend about 6 to 8% of the GDP yearly for security to defend uh, itself from, uh, from, from Russia, uh, uh, escalation of uh, uh, in, uh, uh, further aggression. So there is another problem. Uh, he has to deal with, uh, I would say, not very efficient uh, uh, formats to deal with Russia, normal the formula and needs formula. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in my first intervention, I, I don't think that the countries like Germany and France, they want to solve the conflict. They just want to freeze the conflict and come back to the business as you well with, you know, with Russia. So I think he, he doesn't, I mean, Zelensky doesn't have the honest brokers on, on the Western part of, of, of the continent. So uh, I think that surprisingly, he's, he's doing quite well, still having about, uh, 
25% uh, of, of support. That's not bad. That's not bad. Uh, uh, um, he promised a lot, of course, and he cannot deliver everything, but uh, he's doing quite, quite well. That's why we're supposed to use this opportunity and help him further, not to criticize and, uh, and uh, reinvent the wheel that finally the first. Let, let, let me, uh, let's be honest. In, in many cases in Western Europe, um, uh, many of our, of our colleagues, many of our friends, uh, uh, members of the European Union, uh, they do not uh, fulfill the requirements of the membership right now. Uh, in case of uh, economic uh, situation, in case, in case of other you know, political uh, aspects. So how we can push uh, Ukraine to be the, uh, the better than us, than ourselves, you know? It's like uh, asking to be more papis than the Pope in Rome. You know, that's the that's Polish uh, mention, the Polish say. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to remind the audience we have only about 15 minutes or so to go. If you have any questions, you can pose them in chat mode, and I will adapt one of the questions and turn it to Dan Fried because, uh, again, we've already invoked the issues of uh, security and NATO and so on. And the question is, uh, is there anything to expect from the Biden administration in terms of reopening the issue of a Ukraine in NATO or of urging the Europeans to open their doors, or is there too much real politic now in, in Washington and the idea that neither France nor at least Germany <laughs> current political uh, conf uh, configurations uh, uh, cannot be uh, convinced on either of those uh, important processes? Um, I was at the Bucharest NATO summit in April, 2008 when we fought up to the last minute and in the leaders meeting room to get a map for Ukraine and Georgia, and we failed. What we got was actually a statement that the ultimate goal for Georgia and Ukraine was NATO membership. That's what the leaders agreed. That was Angela Merkel working with the Poles, the Baltic States, Condi Rice, um, you know, huddling. The, if we push for a map now, we'll lose. Okay, I'm being brutal, but that's a fact. However, we, the challenge that Minister Vashchikovsky raised and that Prime Minister Kobilius mentioned of a clear perspective for Ukraine of what the end state is, is important. If so, if we push for map now, we'll lose. I don't think the European Union is ready to explicitly promise membership, but we can't leave Ukraine hanging as if we expect them to be in a gray zone because that is an invitation for Putin. How do you bridge this gap? It seems to me we need to be clear about Ukraine's ultimate destination as a member of an undivided Europe and an undivided Euro-Atlantic community. We have to be clear about the ultimate end state and, that, and be clear that to some degree, it, Ukraine can be the author of its own fate, but they need our support. They can, we cannot throw everything on them. We need to be clear about the end state, and then we work at the details, piece by piece. That's easier said than done. Um, look, I have vivid memories of the early 90s, and I can assure Minister Vashchikovsky that in the most difficult periods of Poland's transformation, say 91, 92, 93, Washington was nowhere ready at all to acknowledge what Poland's ultimate destination would be. I mean, I, I was fighting those fights. When the Clinton administration started wrestling with this issue, Poland was already seen as a success. They had done it. 
and and the, the what was the roughest year in Poland's transformation? I don't know, maybe 1992, right? You can argue it, but I would say 1992 was the toughest year. They didn't have a perspective, but and, and Minister Wojtykowski is absolutely right. They had a national consensus. They had a national consensus. They also had a more benign Russia. Absolutely true. So where's Ukraine? It doesn't have quite the national consensus that Poland did in the early days, but it's getting one. Thanks to Vladimir Putin, who didn't, they, I mean, whose position is basically that Ukrainian, the Ukrainian people doesn't exist, except maybe they're fascists. I mean, it's a disgusting position. And I think so, I, I see as an outsider, Ukrainian opinion consolidating in a pro-European direction. Secondly, we have a worse absolutely a stronger Russia and a more aggressive Russia. On the other hand, Ukraine has one advantage that Poland and the Baltic states didn't have in the early 90s. In the early 90s, most people in the West and some Poles thought you can never build democracy and a free market economy on the ruins of communism. It's impossible because it had never been done. It had never even been contemplated. The Ukrainians know it is possible. It's not easy. God knows, you know, Poland, Slovakia, the Baltic states, they got tons of problems. But look where they are. Look where they are. Ukraine knows it is possible. So we all have our challenges. Yeah, we can't offer Ukraine the same kind of explicit deal that we offered Poland a generation ago. But there's a lot we can do. We need to do our part. Ukraine needs to do its part. Look, I have the, the, I have the bias of a former policymaker where you're supposed to take a miserable situation and not um, revel in the misery, but figure out what you are going to do to achieve the results you want. And I think we, I think we can get there. Thank you. Uh, I will, we have a an audience question that talks about, asks why doesn't the West take specific affirmative measures that will require Putin to turn inward? And I want to refer uh, to uh, an article that uh, Dan and I wrote for Foreign Policy this week, which makes the case that incremental sanctions are having an effect on Putin. But if you look at them from the perspective of the long term, they have a dramatic effect on the size of and scale of the Russian economy. If you, if the Russian, in the last seven years, the Russian economy, according to our colleague Andish Oslund, has grown 0.3% annually, while the OECD countries have grown at about 2.3% annually. If Russia falls behind, and Russia has one and a half percent less growth than it would otherwise in the absence of sanctions. In 20 years, it will be about 35 to 40 percent a smaller economy uh, than it is than it is otherwise. If that rate could be pushed down to two and a half percent through the effect of sanctions and perhaps energy <laughs> technological changes and the move towards green energy and less dependence on the kinds of resources that Russia has, it could mean that Russia will be 70% to 80% smaller 20 years from now. So from the strategic point of view, a smaller Russia will have less ability to project power. And I wanted to kind of introduce this discussion because we did talk a little bit about sanctions. Sanctions often seem to be a, a tough thing for uh, well, you're easy for parliamentarians to vote on, but often tough for governments to, uh, uh, to, to implement. What are your thoughts about uh, the possibility of, of adding this dimension of uh, you know, containment, this economic dimension of containment, not simply to satisfy, legitimately to satisfy our moral anger or to, or to react to specific Russian events, but as an overall kind of strategic approach to have a less powerful Russia and to get the Russian elite to understand that if it wants to grow, it has to reach an accommodation with the West. And I'll start, ask Madame von Krommen if she is willing to take this on and our other speakers, but briefly, because we're in the last yeah. we're the last hurdles of our, of our uh, 90 minute race. 
It can be very briefly, and many people who have followed the policy of the Greens can confirm, hopefully, that we have, not just for this reason, but also for this reason, for the geostrategical strategical reason, try to enforce the independence of Russian gas, of all Russian fossil fuels, um, uh, to, to uh, increase uh, the independence uh, as much as we can, because this would ruin the business model of uh, the state kleptocracy, uh, of, of Putin's um, alliance um, in, in the Kremlin. Uh, most of his fundamentals are based on the sale of fossil fuels such as gas, uh, uranium, um, oil, and, and others. Um, if we can make sure that we uh, put our money, our investment into renewables and others, and uh, can uh, reduce our uh, energy uh, uh, consumption significantly, and that's why Putin uh, fights the Greens as well, not just because of our tougher uh, stand um, against his uh, foreign policy, but also uh, that, of course, we would like to see a complete different energy uh, policy. I know this is not in line with everyone here on the panel, but at least it is very coherent when it comes to a Russian uh, Russia strategy. And also, I would be in favor of taking another stick uh, when it comes to the SWIFT um, uh, a sanction. And I would go, I mean, especially now the threat with the military, the last so-called maneuver, which they will continue and they will start again uh, at the end of this year with a new separate uh, maneuver. Um, I would just start and also the support for Belarus and all the other little bits and pieces here and there and, and uh, the, the, um, the uh, street of uh, Kerch, which we have seen there, uh, cut them off uh, of SWIFT for six months and see how much they will uh, would be cooperate uh, with the West, as you have said. I would go for much tougher uh, ways of handling this economical ties and really would like to see a commitment whether they are ready to cooperate with international partners and whether they would like to play after international rules or not. I think the SWIFT um, um, agreement or SWIFT treaty um, could be an easy, um, let's say, uh, ground to test uh, this commitment from the Russian side. Thank you. And uh, without being partisan in terms of Germ Germany's political future, at the very least, we have uh, the expectation of some potential for some of these views to be a part of the discussion of policy going, going forward if the German people vote the way that at least current polls uh, uh, suggest. We are close to our to the end, so I won't ask any further specific questions, but just ask uh, uh, Prime Minister Kobilius for a couple of minutes of concluding remarks. And similarly, Mr. Voschikovsky, I will not ask Dan Fried because he gave a such a peroration that it seemed like the conclusion of our of our of our meeting. And ask all of you to stay on because we're going to do a screenshot before we go online uh, offline of all the participants. But please wait for that. So, uh, Minister Vosh Tchaikovsky, last thoughts uh, to bring us to, uh, Minister, Prime Minister Kabilius, to bring us uh, uh, to our conclusion. Well, uh, really, thanks a lot, uh, first of all, for, for this very, 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 very interesting uh, conversation. Second, uh, despite the fact that I am from EPP, family where German CDU is part of that family, uh, I can just agree with Viola uh, von Kramon, you know, and, and to hope that uh, really things can be going in that way. Uh, because I, I absolutely agree that what, you know, uh, when we're talking about uh, policy towards Russia, we need to see very clearly. Uh, personal sanctions are, are interesting, you know, but they are not uh, making big impact. You know, so-called Ukrainian sanctions, which were introduced, economical sanctions, which were introduced after, you know, occupation of Crimea, so they, they are painful. But the biggest uh, uh, and the largest issue really is, uh, you know, how to cut uh, EU dependency on Russian gas. 
And that is, you know, much larger topic than only, you know, North Stream 2, which again, I am against very much, you know, but, but we should not, you know, concentrate only on North Stream 2. Unfortunately, what I see in the numbers, you know, since uh, Norwegian gas and uh, North Sea gas is, is, is going to be, you know, uh, it's, it's coming to, to the end, EU dependence on Russian gas can increase if we shall not start really to be serious about how to, how to cut that, that dependency. Because as I said, you know, Norwegian gas is, is going to the end. Russian gas and the resources of Russian gas can in, increase uh, because of climate change, because you know, they are getting more access towards Arctic and some all new fields. So that is where our priority should be. You know, very, very, very tough and radical priority. Really Green Deal here is uh, one of, 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 of the benefits which we can try to, to, to implement. And where we need to look for totally new, you know, new alternatives for time being, maybe, you know, LNG terminals, but in, in, in looking into the future, we need to look into new technologies and then whatever, you know, green hydrogen or, or things like that should be our priority. And, uh, and uh, we need to discuss those issues in a, in a very, you know, uh, radical way here in the European Parliament. And I hope that we shall come to that. And Maybe, you know, uh, decision of Kremlin to punish uh, President of Par European Parliament Sosoli uh, recently shows that uh, Putin started to understand that European Parliament is, you know, not just, uh, an, how to say, a body of empty statements. Some things we can do in, in, in the Parliament also. Thank you very much, Minister Vostokovsky. Two minutes of concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure this is a concluding remark, but uh, final word from, from Poland, from Warsaw. If you ask uh, uh, in Warsaw about our position, uh, our approach, our attitude towards Russia, the, the answer will be also uh, common for all Poles. The smaller, the weaker, the better. The smaller Russia, the weaker Russia, the better. I don't want to say, I, I don't want to say that uh, uh, Americans are naive, uh, as uh, Dan Prin mentioned. I would say it, it, I, I'm less optimistic. I do not believe that uh, Russia will follow our path of transformation. We were naive in 1990s during the Yeltsin time, and then later during the Medvedev time, the so-called technocrat that we were hoping that sooner or later Russia will follow our transformation. Uh, it, it didn't, it didn't happen, it did uh, not happen. Uh, and I'm not naive also that even if we get rid of Putin and Mr. Navalny will be the president of, of Russia, Russia will be only a little bit less imperialistic and less nationalistic, but will be still uh, the country which is uh, which is going to fight for the uh, for the position, we cannot satisfy them. We offer them almost everything. They are part of uh, Security Council of United Nations. They are part of uh, uh, G7, G8. Uh, they are part of uh, any regional structure to deal with Iran, Palestine, Israel, North Korea. European Union offered them unique privileges. NATO offered them unique privileges. They are rejecting everything. They are rejecting everything. So what else we can give them to satisfy them? Nothing. We have to start opposite uh, policy to punish them uh, and to force them to, uh, to respect, to obey, obey international law, international uh, standards. And we have to force not only Putin, but part of the society which is supporting him to, to, respect, uh, to respect us like uh, the other countries. Thank you all. Before we leave, uh, I'd like all of us, including our audience, to stay on. Dr. Maria Preschlak is going to join us for concluding remarks and our uh, screenshot of every participant. So we're gonna ask everybody to click on your uh, video, not your audio, because that will be very loud, and we will take a shot. But I want to just express my own gratitude for being in the company, uh, not of politicians, but of 
uh, statesmen and, and a stateswoman, people who think broadly, people who have uh, you know, a deep intellectual command of strategic issues and a deep knowledge of uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's an honor to be in your company and to have had this uh, discussion. And I'm very grateful to the Ukrainian Free University, which is true to its century uh, of roots of uh, discussion uh, outside of the territory uh, of Ukraine. And I want to turn to uh, Dr. Maria Prishlak to uh, send us off again. Thank you very much. Very briefly, I wanted to just join the, our moderator, Adrian Karatnitsky, in thanking all our distinguished panelists for this truly uh, insightful and illuminating uh, discussion. And I would like to thank our audience for joining us and to invite them to uh, join us for the next event. Uh, thank you to all and uh, all the best. And now we will take the screenshot. <laughs>